member of there we go. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, I am a member of Radical Public Health's Abolition Committee that helped organize this panel. Before we get started, I'm going to pass it over to Jordan. Let's just move. There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Jordan Ordonez. I'm also RPH member, pronouns he, him. Um, and today we would like to acknowledge that the University of Illinois at Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples. Um, the area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. And as you work, live, and play on these territories, we must ask that what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous communities struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. And by making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. Another thing that we want to do before we get into the meat of things is to introduce um, RPH, Radical Public Health, as an organization, and a little bit about our, um, our, our committee. Um, so Radical Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago is an organization um, of the UIC School of Public Health. We're open to anyone, students, staff, community members, and alumni. And uh, our goal is to seek to address systemic and underlying causes of public health challenges and consider more radical solutions. As an abolition committee, we believe that the public health community can play a key role in shifting away from harmful punitive paradigms towards preventative strategies that abolish the need for carceral institutions, including but not limited to policing, incarceration, immigrant detention facilities, and as we were exploring today, um, the family and child regulation systems. We demand a comprehensive preventative and equity driven public health approach, including not limited to disinvestment and decarceration of the current carceral system and the investment in affordable housing, quality healthcare and education, economic opportunity, transportation and other social systems. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it on to Al and Alfred. Hi everybody, my pronouns are he, him. My name's Alfred, I'm also I'm part of the abolition committee. So these uh, community guidelines aren't meant to cover everything, but it's just kind of jumping off points. So keep that in mind. So first we have um, keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A. Um, be prepared to be uncomfortable as we go through some issues and different concepts that might be new to people. Avoid, avoid any tone policing, please. And if possible, please have your video on when asking questions or engaging with the panelists. We understand that that's not always possible. So just like let us know, that's fine. Uh, listen with love and use active listening and humble listening. So just make sure that we're not um, trying to be combative, you know, and try to assume that people have good intentions. We're all here to learn from panelists and learn from each other. Um, challenge the idea, not the person that just ties into that. Um, don't make it personal and about like talking back to somebody. Um, be open to making mistakes. Like I said, we're all here to learn and um, signal to us when you don't understand some jargon or any words or terms that might be unfamiliar with you. Um, we all want to come out of this um, learning something, and we all have different things that we might not be aware of. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to pass that on. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan and Alfred. So now let's meet our awesome panelists. Um, before we begin with the organizer-led Q&A, followed by an audience-led Q&A, Elena, also a UIC alum, um, would you start us off and briefly introduce yourself, the work that you do, and then popcorn to another panelist? Absolutely. Um, thank you to everyone at Radical Public Health for this incredible invitation. Um, my name is Elena. I use she, her pronouns. I am a recent UIC graduate um, with my master's of social work. Um, where I specialized in organization and community practice. And I am here uh, due to my work um, collaborating with four other UIC students and the Shriver Center on Poverty Law and Social Service Workers Uprising Now in New York City and Dr. Ellen Detloff at the University of Houston to create an alternative to calling DCFS guide, which was very much sparked with uh, which was very much sparked by um, a real demonstrated communi need, uh, communicated need among social service workers 
for ways to identify uh, um, issues with um, mandated reporting laws and to find more supportive alternatives when the biggest presenting issue is that um, a family um, is lacking um, resources. Um, of course, I, I am coming uh, from Chicago. I also do want to mention, um, I will be talking a little bit about um, connections between labor exploitation and the harms of the family regulation system. And I do also wanna say and express some solidarity to uh, the SEIU 73 workers that are currently striking um, across Cook County, including the Cook County hospital system. Uh, I will uh, popcorn it to Joyce. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you guys for inviting me to be here on this panel. I'm not gonna be as detailed as Elena. I am a, <laughs> I'm the founder of JMAC for Families and Parent Legislative Action Network. I'm an activist here in New York. I work to change legislation. Um, one of the things I hope to change is to turn mandated reporters into mandated supporters. And I guess the whole, purpose for me is truth over, over tradition. Traditionally, we have destroyed families. We're gonna start telling the truth about it and we're gonna to begin to make some changes. And with that, I will pop point it to my girl Fallon. Hello everyone, I'm excited to be here, although a little bit tired. <laughs> um, I am on the East Coast as well. Um, I, would, I am currently a professor um, at the University of Richmond School of Law. Um, and I am the director of the Family Law Clinic here, the Jeanette Littman Family Law Clinic. Um, we are hoping to take the clinic in a direction of representation of parents um, who are involved in the child welfare system. That's sort of been how we've started off um, prior, to prior to coming to the University of Richmond a couple years ago. I worked at the Bronx Defenders as a public defender um, where I represented parents accused of abuse and neglect. Um, I did that for six or so years. Um, and I, while I was in New York, I also taught at Cardozo Law. Um, same thing, represented, representation as it, work, as it relates to representing parents. Um, but the most important thing I think that came out of my time in New York was my work in coalition with organizations such as Plan with Joyce. Um, and um, working directly with community members to um, you know, create legislation, um, to think through policy changes, and to think through the intersectionality of how um, different issues um, intersect with people who are involved in the child welfare system. And so some of the groups I work with are you know, groups who were involved in um, incarcerate, incarcerated parents, um, you know, child advocacy groups, um, you know, substance use, uh, thinking through issues of substance use and how it is criminalized in the child welfare system, thinking through the criminalization of people and specifically women um, in the medical field, um, reproductive justice networks. Um, and so I started to build this sort of network and connection of people where it was saying, where essentially me and a few other um, as we're saying, we have to start inserting child welfare into all of these narratives because what we recognize is that people who are involved in the child welfare system are highly policed and criminalized largely because of their involvement in these other systems, right? And the harm here is significant because it ultimately can lead to what we call the death penalty for many families, which is termination of parental rights. And so I do a lot of work um, as it relates to representation of people um, and termination of parental rights proceedings, prevent prevention work. And I try to center most of my work at the intersection of the different collateral issues that can affect people. That being said, that's led me to doing a lot of coalitions and uh, national conversations and groups around these issues on um, a state level um, here in Virginia um, in coordination with people on a national level. I'm here in Virginia now. When I was in New York, I worked with people on a local and state level in New York. Um, but I still have those contacts and try to maintain that network nationally um, as it relates to understanding the policy. Um, and then also trying to work in academia to, you know, educate people about these issues that oftentimes um, have been sort of you know, push to the wayside and then in the name of protecting children um, and sort of changing the narrative of what the harm, what the harms are. Well, sorry, not changing the narrative of what the harms are, 
raising awareness about what the harms are of being involved in the child welfare system and how that system, which is constituted in white supremacy, has harmed black and brown families and low income families, but then also changing the narrative about the people who are actually involved in that system as it relates to what it is that they are doing in terms of raising um, their children. So I'm happy to be here today and happy to answer any questions that you guys might have about any of those issues. And I'm really happy to join this esteemed panel of others. Um, panelists. Thank you. Victoria, would you mind going? I need a popcorn. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I need a popcorn. Um, I'll, I'll popcorn it to Victoria. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, my name is Victoria. I am currently a PhD student at UCLA. Um, also received my MSW from UCLA. Um, and I work mostly in child welfare abolition, more specifically looking at how data is used and shared um, throughout the child welfare system. Um, I guess I'll just take this time to also acknowledge um, the amazing work that I'm doing in coalition um, with Stop LAPD Spying here in LA, also um, Mothers in Downtown uh, Women's Action Coalition um, through LA Can and Skidder Row. So just shouting um, them out. And we're working on, you know, how to combat surveillance through the child welfare system and more broadly, um, and what um, a world could look like without the child welfare system or family policing system. And I will popcorn to Kamaria. Hi everyone, my name is Kamari Excel. I'm really happy to be here. I use pronouns she, her. Um, and my work really for the past nine months primarily has been looking at the ways that social workers are complicit in the system of white supremacy um, through policing and surveillance. And so um, working with students, faculty, um, as well as JMAC for Families and also Elena um, and Mandated Supporting, which is really looking at changing the curriculum that social workers and other mandated uh, reporters receive, which of course is fear-based and uh, pushes the urgency to report without considering how we truly center families and what they really need. Um, I'm also a full spectrum doula. And so really bringing in that element of reproductive justice, which is oftentimes um, the issue of family regulation is left out of that conversation. And so finding ways to bridge all these different ways that um, families are denied reproductive justice. So thank you all so much. And I'm excited to be here. All right. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. You are all doing amazing work and we are so thankful to have you here taking time out of your busy days doing such amazing work to be with us. Um, so without further ado, why don't we jump into our um, Q&A. So whoever would like to take it, if all of you would like to, you know, take it, that's awesome. But what is the historical context of family regulation in the United States? I know a lot of folks here aren't necessarily familiar with that history, so a little bit of a background would be super helpful. Well, I like layman terms, so I would just say slavery. That's the historical context. That's what it derives from. Um, policing derives from slavery. Police came from the people who chase the runaway slave. Um, it's a system of surveillance. It's unfortunate that uh, mandated reporters, social workers have been sucked into this system of harm in the way that they have been, because I don't believe it was ever the intention of someone who wanted to become a social worker to surveil and police families and not support them because when we look at this system that has been created, um, there's a lot of surveillance and we use the word surveillance as if it's synonymous with support and it's not. They're two separate words with two separate meanings, but they utilize it that way to confuse people as to what's really happening. They say they are there to protect, but white America has never protected me. And I don't expect them to ever protect me without a real fight. And that's why we're here today to talk about it. I'm going to start off out the gate. If foster care was a good thing, we would only get into affirmative action. The fact that we're fighting to get out and not fighting to get in tells me right there, there's a problem. Dallin, you got your hand up. I don't know how to follow that up, Joyce. Um, <laughs> I just got to, okay, throw the gravel down. So um, I was just going to say that, you know, I guess to add to 
um, what Joy said, we're thinking about this issue of slavery, because I don't think it gets enough attention. Um, I think most people don't like to think about the child welfare system in relation to slavery, in relation to white supremacy. I have been in a room with people who are, you know, the top people in this field, and they are trying to pull the conversation away from race as it relates to the child welfare system, right? Um, and so I am one to always say, please, let's recenter this back and think about the historical context. And when we're thinking about slavery, what we're talking about is chattel slavery, um, the, the ripping apart of children from Black parents, um, I would say also Native parents, right, Black and Brown, if we just want to be, uh, that's not a political term to use, but that's what I'm going to use now. Um, so ripping apart children, um, not parents, you know, moms, dads, not having the opportunity to make decisions in their child, their children's lives, um, their autonomy being taken away from them and being um, held by the person who owned them. Um, at the time, that was largely, um, you know, their slave owner at the time. Today, that is the state, <laughs> right? The state is stepping in and, that same, and taking that same sort of authoritative power and taking away their autonomy from families to raise their children. And the interesting thing about this, and we talk about this when I'm, when, you know, working with my students, is like, what's the history of that, right? So we know there was slavery. We know that, you know, people were emancipated. Um, there's this, we know there's this reconstruction period and all that sort of thing. But if you, the, the context of the legislation is that um, welfare programs were initially advocated for and pushed for by white women. Um, and this was to support white women not to support black and brown families. Um, largely the people who were emancipated were still having to struggle on their own as sharecroppers and in very low income positions and largely still became institutionalized by the, the carceral system through mass incarceration, right? Because of all the different laws that were created just because they were black. Um, so welfare was initially populated in the early 1900s to, to support white women who were single parents, um, and who needed aid. It was not until federal legislation was passed, I believe in 1970, 1960s, 1970s, um, that started providing fund funding through CAFTA um, for welfare programming that it became transferred into, now we want to um, survey black and brown families, right? If you, because they were originally excluded from being able to receive any sort of aid whatsoever. Um, and so once it became a question of now we have to provide them with aid, then it also became a question of now we should beef up surveillance in these communities. Um, and originally the people who were creating this legislation recognized in the early 19, um, 80s that, you know, we are doing harm to these communities. They recognized this because it was through the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, it was it was clear at the, the, the sort of the heightened levels of Indian um, children who were removed, the, the communities that were obliterated because of the child welfare system, right? Um, and the black and brown communities. And so at that point they said, we should start focusing funding on prevention pushing resources into communities, right? Um, and you know, to sort of prevent removal. And it was, what happened then? The, the drug war happened. <laughs> the, the war on black and brown families happened. And it wasn't just in a criminal sense, it was in thinking about, it was criminalizing substance use, right? Um, children were ripped away from their families at record numbers during the time in which there was also a war on supposed users and dealers of um, crack. and we rec and I'm saying crack and I'm being very specific about that um, because yes, opioid was an issue at that time, but the largely the, the drug of choice that what people were being criminalized for was crack and not cocaine. Um, and then after that, that um, obliteration of these families what Dorothy Roberts coins as family disintegration started to happen in the late 1980s. Then you had child welfare advocates come through. These are the prevent child abuse um, advocates saying, Mandated reporters, social workers, um, DSS workers saying, you know what? These kids are languishing in foster care too long. Now we need to beef up the timeline for termination of parental rights. And now you get asked for legislation. Then you get the legislation for, um, oh my God, what is it? The criminal, the, the crime bill, right? The, a part of the crime bill was to increase funding to provide to social service organizations and other organizations to become 
police officials in black and brown communities, right? And so that was part of the funding in the crime bill that was that was told very closely by the AFSCME bill that um, shortened the length of time in which children were supposed to remain in foster care to achieve permanency. So I think when we're talking about the historical context, it is born and rooted in white supremacy. The system as it exists today is largely managed by um, by white people. It is the system that is built to benefit white people. Um, and it, from just in terms of even thinking about welfare aid, right? Um, and so the fact that the casualty in this system has been black and brown children isn't happened since. And the fact that it's been black and brown families isn't happened since. That's exactly how the system was created. So when we're starting this conversation and as we engage, I just want to be very mindful that when we're talking about reforming a system, we're attempting to talk about reforming a system that came out of slavery. And quite frankly, you can't you can't reform slavery, right? The only way to end that is to end the system. And so, yes, I do believe that a part of this conversation has to be, well, what can we do right now, right? Like as advocates right now, how what can we do on a micro level right now to get towards that ultimate goal? But I think we also have to keep the ultimate goal in mind, which is that the only way to achieve um, an equitable remedy for people who are entangled in this system, largely poor black and brown people, is to abolish this system and reimagine something else. So that's what I'll add to that. Yeah, I think I was next, but not much to add because Joyce and uh, Professor Fallon said that amazing. Um, I guess the only thing I wanted to add is that like this system is a capitalistic system. Of course, it's like that goes hand in hand with white supremacy, um, but just even from the roots of the child welfare system and what it's formed after, right? If you're thinking about orphan trains, it was really about the extraction of child labor and um, moving child labor to certain parts of the country that needed that labor, right? So when we're thinking about the child welfare system, we have to think about this infrastructure being a money-making one. That's why built, um, legislation like ASFA has is termed the bounty system, right? Um, because there's like a four, four to $6,000 um, basically price tag on black children. So like you have to consider that like this, this um, system has always been a money making system has always been focused on the appropriation of bodies for money. Um, and even though it's more hidden now, what I wouldn't say it's hidden, but for some people it's more hidden now. And um, it, they people are smarter about it. Um, it's still happening. Um, and it's just people aren't paying enough attention to it. So I guess that's the only thing I wanted to add. And really, um, the thing that I want to add is um, sometimes when the social work profession discusses this history, it gets kind of framed as, oops, social work accidentally slipped on a, a banana and a peel and did a bunch of oppressive things. When really like that, that like, uh, like that is also very much baked into the, into the profession. When I talk about the profession, I talk about the 19th century, starting to professionalize and credentialize the care and community work that has all that has always existed. I'm talking about the starting point of a group of wealthy lesbians in Chicago are trying to figure out how to live independently in a socially acceptable way and they came up with we're going to buy a house and do this thing called social work um, and serve the poor. And the thing about that is, um, if you look at how Jane Addams and Julia Lathrop and these and these and these and these women approached some of these social problems, they're looking at a framework of we have to control all of these air quotes bad children who are roaming the streets, which is still pretty much the exact same way that Chicago Police Department talks about young people today. Um, and um, like very much um, the juvenile injustice system was created by social workers. Um, the first major social work profession, pro social work professional organization was called the, the Association of Corrections and Charities. Um, so um, all of this carceral logic really did like was foundational to the establishment of the, prof of the profession and is still very much upheld um, today. Um, so social work's role in this was not an accident at all. Um, and I'll briefly add to all the amazing things that have been said. Um, I think it's important to also acknowledge the historical context of language, thinking about the way that the term welfare queen and crack babies and 
all these divisive terms and dog whistle politics that have been used that continue to be used today to discuss who is quote fit to be a parent. And that's today, uh, recently I was talking to a parent where, you know, literally on her paperwork, she's saying, yeah, they are deeming me as unfit. Like that's language that's still being used operating today. It didn't go anywhere. And so for me, when I think about historical context, a lot of times for like, well, you would think that, you know, nowadays things would be different, but in my mind, how I always frame it is, I like to think of historical context as just iOS updates. You know, you get an update on your phone, same system, just an improvement. So same old white supremacy, just different ways to improve that system. Um, and it's working perfectly. It was designed this way. And so as someone recently said, I believe it was Fallon where you can't um, improve the system. There's nothing to add to it. You have to abolish it and start over. Um, but I really want to just keep, you know, bringing up the way that language plays such an important role and is still operating. And the way that also social work has uh, been able to bridge with the clinical field. So when we talk about neglect and abuse, uh, when 80% of folks in child welfare are of neglect and 20% is that really um, abuse that we hear those those rare cases that come out but those are often overshadowed by the 80 percent and that 80 percent is dealing from the effects of capitalism and white supremacy those are folks who need food food banks or who need job opportunities that's not you know that's not abuse that's um being abused from white supremacy so i also want to bring up that point as well so i i just want to jump in real quick um before another question is asked because I like to frame for people who've never met me. While there's a few people on this call that I know, there's quite a few that have not heard my spiel about the parallels between mass incarceration and foster care. And this is important because it only it gives us not only a framework of um, how they're set up to be just the same, but it helps us to visualize it. Because oftentimes we don't want to believe that this stuff is done perfect. perfect purposefully and it is you know it's not by accident that the 13th amendment is the loophole to continue to have slaves in this country and through that loophole which started out as incarceration we now have mass incarceration so just to quickly give us this, the parallels it's children and prisoners are both strip search children under the guise of checking for marks and bruises as kamaria just said but it's 86% in New York City, children who are there for reasons related to neglect. So why do you need to strip search a child in relation to neglect charges? They're both separated from everything and everyone they know and love and are familiar with. They both eat what they are served. They both have set visit times on set visit days. They both have oversight during the visit period. They both change homes and cells regularly. They both use garbage bags and or pillowcases to change locations. And we'll fast forward to the end because of time. They both are paroled back to either their family or to the community. And during the parole period, they both have oversight and they can both be separated for any minute infraction. And I will air quote the infraction because we're not talking about anything in relation to a crime, right? So. Here's a system that they say was built to protect children that only black and brown children are in, but it resembles the incarceral state um, of incarceration. And it just says to me, truth over tradition, right? As long as we continue to deny that this was done purposefully, then we um, are in a situation where chances are we're trying to unravel something that we will never unravel because we're giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. We have to call this system what it is. It's demonic, right? It was built on hate. It was built on ensuring that there was a group of people that would never move forward in the society in America. Um, so they take out children and they prepare them to be the next generation of slaves because any system built to actually protect children should in no way mimic a system that was purposefully built to punish adults. So the fact that we have that and when we look at the outcomes and then we look at the role that mandated reporters and social workers have played because social workers are not the only mandated reporters, we have now put people in position to surveil families 
to put them in a system that we know creates poor outcomes while we complain about what happens at home, which is nothing in comparison to what happens in a system. We are surveillancing people for the sole purpose of putting them into that system. Thank you all for your responses. They really gave a great historical background and lots of parallels. Joyce, you actually transitioned us perfectly into the second question, um, which is what is the current reality of the child welfare system in the United States and how does it disproportionately harm black and brown communities? I know we already touched on this a bit, but if we could go more into depth, that would be awesome. Well, the current reality is we have people fooled into believing that they're protecting children. And, and, and it's the biggest lie ever told. How are you protecting children when they're more likely to become teenage parents, when they're less likely to graduate high school, when they're more likely to be drug addicted, when they're more likely to develop a mental illness, when they're more likely to age out into homelessness? This is how we perpetuate the prison industrial complex through foster care, because all of these more likelies and less likelies lead to more likely being incarcerated, which they are. They are incarcerated at rates much higher than a child who have never been impacted by the child welfare system, so they would like to call it, but there's no welfare for a child. So even the language that we utilize is to condition us to believe that something's being done that's not being done. And so we need to call it what it is. It's a policing system because social workers assess. Um, what CPS does is investigate. Social workers, um, again, assess, right? And they try to meet the needs and meet the person where they are through that assessment. What does CPS do? They punish and they separate like the police. They search your home. They do all of the things that align with police, but they try to hide behind social work. It is two different things, just like surveillance and support are two different things. The first thing we have to do is look at their language. For me, the only language I speak is English. So I clearly understand what it is they're doing and how they're doing it. And I just ask others to get on board with me because it doesn't take rocket science to understand that this is nonsense and that they're brainwashing us all. And, they, and, and, and those of us who are not brainwashed by them feel compelled to keep their jobs. Well, I have to make this call. And it's so confusing and so convoluted exactly what mandated reporting is. Then we move to the next layer, which is cover your own ass becomes what's mandated. It's not about mandating to help us to support, which is the first thing they put out front, but through the threat of losing your employment or yourself facing um, a conviction of, um, it's not a felony right below. The point is nobody wants to go to jail or face any type of um, imprisonment. So cover your own ass, right? Better safe than sorry. Make sure the kid is safe. But how is a kid coming to school eating two meals a need to make a phone call. I remember a call was made on my daughter at about the age of eight or nine years old because she was chasing a little boy in her school yard and couldn't catch him while they were playing tag. She grabbed his backpack, he fell on his behind and the school said she was aggressive. They called me from work in hysteria, complete hysteria, and then told me I needed to get her a mental health evaluation. When I told them, fuck you, they called ACS. I'm sorry about that. But basically that's what it is because kids are allowed to play tag. Don't call me off my job in complete hysteria like my child is in an ambulance or something to tell me she snatched the child's backpack and that was violent. When can black girls be children? When can black boys be children? When can black people just be? Elena, I think you were next. Yeah, um, so this actually uh, was something that a colleague of mine who is also a new social worker just shared and I do have permission to discuss this, um, but um, they um, they had to make a call to, Illinois, to the Illinois DCFS hotline um, and they were frustrated with having to make this call because they didn't think it would be the best option to keep 
the family safe, but as just as Joyce mentioned, they didn't want to face discipline if if they didn't call. So they made the call, um, which involved um, some issues with a parent being physically violent and then also um, um, behaving inappropriately, behaving sexually inappropriately um, in front of his children. And the the hotline operator was very dismissive. Oh, well, if, if the kids weren't involved in that, they should have just been sleeping. That, you don't need to call about that. What, what's your problem? Um, and, and, and my colleague was like even, and like they were even more traumatized and upset with how this was handled. The other parent who had disclosed this was also more traumatized and upset because, you know, now this other parent is getting the message of this system doesn't actually care about your safety and well being. Um, and so my colleague then had to spend just more time doing some more, you know, casework to ensure that, you know, this parent and her kids would be in a more safe environment. Um, and that really just speaks to something where we have this system set up to surveil and terrorize parents whose kids act slightly out of pocket on the playground, which is what kids do when they are eight. Um, or there was a case um, recently in Chicago where a school principal uh, called um, DCFS on a parent because there was a transit mix up um, and she couldn't pick up her son until seven minutes after the cutoff day, cutoff time, while at the same time completely ignoring a really horrific case of years long trafficking of a young girl. Um, to where DCFS admitted that they lost some of the paperwork around this um, after the media started to investigate. Um, so really, um, it is a system that really parallel to the criminal legal system is not actually set up at all around safety or child well-being or family well-being because there's there's a serious failure to appropriately to even appropriately in, intervene at what they're supposedly supposed to do. And there's also decades of research kind of backing this up. Um, so really like the reality is they don't, like there is no interest in caring for the safety and well-being of children, but there is a lot of stress and pressure on, you know, workers who frequently are not paid much and for uh, families who are really struggling and, and like the pressures on those folks in really untenable situations. And again, like it's messed up because it was designed to be messed up. This is a feature, not a bug, you know, according to the system. Yeah, I'll add really quickly that, you know, from, from what I've learned about the system um, and my experiences in it, that it is or has become a fear mongering system. It's just based off of fear mongering. Um, and we, the child welfare system has expanded so much because of its obsession with like predicting risk and associating risk. Um, and so we're now we're in a, a, mo a moment in time where the child welfare system is very adamant about um, predicting if a, per, um, if a mother is going to abuse their child in the future. I'm, I mean, I'm talking about like predicting risk while children are still in the womb. And because of that, um, the system has, or the DCFS, DCF, ACS has expanded their collaborations with various systems, including the criminal justice system, um, the departments of mental health, um, education systems to really surveil families because they are fearful or obsessed with this risk. Um, and and um, it's just a way of controlling um, families um, and continues to be a pattern, I would say. And we keep getting money um, to really bolster these prevention um, aspects of the child welfare system. So that's currently what I'm seeing. And of course, we know that that affects uh, Black families, um, families of color, because uh, we are the ones who have the most data. We are the ones who are attracted the most generationally, right? So if you're looking at these risk assessment tools, they're using information from all of these systems that we have histories in because we've been surveilled for so many um, generations. So of course, we're going to be the most impacted and the most surveilled in the current state as well. Uh uh, I just wanted to add a couple of things when we're talking, I think the, the question was sort of thinking about like, well, what is the harm, right? What's the current reality of the system? Well, since ASPA was passed in 1997, there has been over a million adoptions. And I don't say that in a good thing, right? Um, because what that means is that there have been over a million families that have been permanently dismantled, right? Um, and 
in addition to that, what it, we also know that a large percentage of those adoptions have fell through. So those children have returned back to foster care, oftentimes going through that cycle that Joyce talked about earlier, which is the foster care to prison pipeline, right? Um, we also know that those children had the worst outcomes, right? Oftentimes, once many of those children were adopted as young children, you know, zero to three, zero to four years old, by the time they hit teenagers and the trauma starts to resurface, as we learn about through attachment theory, right? That trauma starts to resurface and then no longer do their adopted parents want to care for them. And the law makes it very easily for, easy for them to just take those children back to DSA. Um, they're placed back in foster care. It's much harder for uh, the older children to then be adopted. I represented so many parents where um, when they were coming to court, oftentimes they were coming in, and, I, and this happened so many times, I was, I was flabbergasted. I would be in court, I would get assigned to a non-respondent parent, and I'm talking to the person and they say to me, well, that's my daughter. That's my biological daughter. This is a 14 or 15 year old now who's run away from foster home, right? And now the purported person who adopted them, right, is in, is in court now as the person who's neglecting this child. The bio parent is there. And I've had judges say to me, they don't get an attorney. And we had to take that case pro bono. You know why they don't get attorney? Because their rights have been terminated. They have no biological connection to this child, right, in this case. Um, and that's in a state where parents do are, are afforded attorneys, right, um, to deal with child welfare cases. So that's, that's a part of the harm. And then the second thing is what we recognize is the, the percentage uh, the disproportionate policing, right? Um, you know, I, I think the data says that Black children, um, and I think this is updated data, that Black children make up approximately 13 um, percent of the population, but then are something like 26 to 27 percent of the cases that are called in in child welfare. Um, I think those are the cases that are substantiated, but it doesn't talk about the number of cases that are called. What we know is that um, families who live in low income areas are, and are more likely to be policed in several different ways um, through education systems, through um, low cost medical providers, um, through taking public transportation, through having to go to public benefits offices, um, through you know just being in contact with so many people who are mandated reporters, right? Um, and that places them at a higher risk of having their kids removed in the same way that driving while black places you at a higher risk of being pulled by the police, right? And then being harmed by the police, right? Um, and so I think when we're talking about the sort of parallels, it's important to remember that largely policing is what's making such a big difference in the disproportionate um, accounting of black and brown children and the child welfare system. And then that being said, I think then you have to move the second step, which is the bias, right? Because even when white families come into contact with the system, they aren't treated the same way that black families are. Black families are more, and brown families are more likely to be recommended for removals, more likely to be recommended for separation, you know, more likely to have longer periods of time before they reunify with their kids uh, for many of the same allegations as white parents, even poor white parents. And, you know, that became very clear with the opioid epidemic, right? And the way in which we systemically treated people who were using opioids as they should have been treated, right? with a substance use um, a condition as opposed to criminalizing them. And so I think like when we're talking about the harms, the harms are beyond the child welfare system. Uh, another example is thinking about marijuana, right, legislation. We know we can see it across the country. It's a sweeping movement to legalize marijuana. And people are saying, oh, that's so much better. But what about all the people whose rights been terminated because of marijuana use? Right? What about all the children who've been incarcerated and placed in foster care because of marijuana use, because of selling marijuana? Like, you know, like those are the harms that we have. What about all the moms who've had their baby stripped from them in the hospital because they tested positive for marijuana or for any substance really without be with being tested without their consent? I think those are the things that we have to consider in terms of thinking about the harm. We have to move beyond just even thinking about the policing, but some of the actual harms that are taking place and like are affecting people um, way past the child protective proceeding. Um, something that I'll add really quickly is um, 
the way that mandated reporting is, in fact, not evidence-based. Um, there's been no complete systematic overview of the effectiveness of, of mandated reporting, um, but there are numerous examples of the way that community care is effective, that when you have people who are a part of that community who are able to speak for themselves, to advocate for themselves, that, that those are effective measures rather than mandated reporting. And um, I also just wanna think about too, when I think about the current state of mandated reporting and um, the family regulation system is the um, lack of regard for intersectionality. Um, as you know, we've said before, the differences between if a white family was um, being talked to by a mandated reporter compared to a black family. I have a colleague who talked about when she went to the dentist, her son had some bruises on her leg, on his leg. And you know, they asked her a couple questions and they were off. I had a client a couple months ago who was sharing to me that she went to the dentist with her child, the child needed some cavities, um, some cavities filled and that turned into something a lot bigger because um, it was, well, why haven't they been to the dentist recently? And all these questions about her parenting and her ability to parent. And so just thinking about even, you know, outside of social workers, there are so many different professions that are mandated reporters. And so when we think about that, it's really a need to, um, establish a sense of accountability for folks who are making reports that are are harmful because what specifically the New York state law says in good faith. So if my good faith is based off of all this years and centuries of implicit bias, I'm, I don't even realize that I'm making a report that's not in good faith. I'm doing what my profession is telling me to do. And so in that regard, social workers are literally following what they're being told. And so that's a huge part of the issue is this need to continue um, in the allegiance to white supremacy and not calling that out. And just briefly, um, also I wanted to piggyback on just thinking about how this intersects with reproductive justice overall. When we think that about reproductive justice, the major tenets are to uh, maintain bodily autonomy to parent the children that we have um, and the right to not have children and to do all of those things in safe and sustainable communities. And when we think about child welfare, we can't say that any of those things hold to be true. And so it this funnels into the ways that also Black women fear um, giving birth and are treated in the medical profession and the number, the rates that, you know, it's more harmful to have a uh, a baby right now as a black woman compared to 1850 during an enslavement right so it's all of these things are connected and we can't talk about fixing one thing without stepping back and looking at all the ways that they're intersecting i just want to go back to something that fallon said um about informed consent and how they drug test women at the hospital for the sole purpose of removing their children because a hospital second um, setting is a place we believe would be able to treat you for whatever your ailment is, right? And so for a hospital setting, setting to stop and frisk your bodily fluids or the bodily fluids of your newborn child to refer you to the child welfare system is bananas. It's just straight bananas because this is the place where if you believe that I'm struggling with some type of social um, substance issue, you should be able to refer me and, and treat me. Um, but further than that, I want to say that a drug test is not a parenting test. And so when did we begin to use bodily fluids to make a determination of someone's character, ability to care for their child, um, financially and emotionally, and all of the other things that we need to look at when we are trying to make a decision as to whether or not a family would need support. So that, that's my biggest thing in regard to that. And as far as what Kamaria was saying, we are not incorrigible. So just a couple of months ago, a nine-year-old girl was pepper sprayed by the police in Rochester, New York. I don't know if people remember that. The, the video was so disturbing. Here is nine officers approximately, men and women, yelling at a nine-year-old who's begging and crying for her daddy, who they are trying to handcuff and she's wiggling and pulling away so that they can't handcuff her and she's crying and she's scared. And then they say to her, you're acting like a child. 
And the nine-year-old says, I am a child. But you would think that would have stopped them. It did not. We're talking mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, older siblings in the role of policing, pepper spraying a nine-year-old who is afraid to put handcuffs on. Because we, as people of color, are not seen as children at any point in time. We're responsible in a way that other people are never responsible. And I want to say that affected my parenting with my children. It impacted how I parented my children because as much as I loved my children, I was so afraid of this hateful society to have to deal with them for anything that I kept the pressure on trying to make them to be something they will never be. None of us will ever be perfect. Don't do this, don't do that, being very upset when it's done. Not because I really cared as an individual, I knew it was a part of child's play, but I did not have the liberty, the luxury, the privilege to allow my child to believe that they could do something that your child as a white person could do. Because my child doing that could have me getting a phone call saying my child is either gravely beaten or dead. And so it changes the dynamics of how we interact with our children, with our siblings, and with other people in our community, because everything becomes a life or a death situation. I shouldn't have to fear being pulled over by the police for a traffic stop. And we need to stop making excuses that he started to run, he did this, he did that. So what? Catch him later. You got the license plate to the car. You know where he live at. You can go to his house and arrest him if that's necessary. Mail him a fucking ticket. Why do we got to shoot someone in the back for that? How do we make excuses? We have to, the first thing we have to do, not just as social workers, but as a society, we have to stop making excuses for the poor behavior. We have to stop fearing things that we have not seen ourselves. Children are afraid of the boogeyman because we tell them there's a boogeyman. Black people are not boogie people. We're not gonna do anything to you. They're, as everybody on this call, I ask people all the time, when's the last time a black man snatched your pocketbook? They haven't experienced that, but yet they're terrified of it happening because that's what we have created from the beginning to create the divide and solidify the divide. We have had to make people choose sides and be fearful through these narratives, like the welfare queen, we're getting something free. We're not getting jack shit free. We've worked and bust our ass for everything we have. Nothing is coming to us free. And the only reason we need welfare is because you pushed us out of school. You suspended us instead of giving us um, detention like you did the white kid. You expelled us purpose, um, permanently instead of allowing us to get a fair education. How do you think that we're gonna be in the boardroom? But I'll tell you what America is. America is a straining system, just like the orange juice I have in the morning. I don't like pulp in my orange juice and I squeeze my orange juice fresh every morning. And I squeeze it and it has pulp and I strain it and I strain it and I strain it. And I can strain it a hundred times. It's still gonna have pulp, but you know what? At a point I drink it anyway because it's tolerable. And that's what America has been to black people. They have strained us through systems from the time that we left our parents' home, from the time that we came out of the womb. They have strained us through systems. And when we get to the boardroom, there's not many of us there, not because we can't be there, not because we're not capable of being there, because you have strained us through your systems. Thank you everyone again, amazing answers, um, really helpful context. Um, we have about just like two minutes before we're gonna switch into audience led Q and A's, but are there any, it seems like we're all abolitionists here, but um, it, I wanted to ask about um, equitable alternatives if we believe there are any to this existing system, or um, as Fallon mentioned previously, or if they're just micro baby, you know, fixes. And we do have a lot of folks on the call who do have medical backgrounds. So if you're able to connect it back to the medical field, that would be greatly appreciated too. 
Awesome. Um, I unmuted um, because I think that there are some challenges creating alternatives. And I say that as someone who worked on an alternatives to DCFS guide. Um, the issues with alternatives is that most support services you would try to refer people to for a service, whether that's um, nutrition, housing, child care, mental health support, are also staffed by mandated reporters. It, it, there really is no escaping that system. Um, and also because we just don't really consider any of these things to be universal public goods. And so even within the alternatives, there's still a lot of carceral things at play and like there are limitations. Um, here in Chicago, there are one of the things we kind of ran into working on this project is that there are some nonprofits that do some limited crisis response or have hotlines, but it's limited hours, limited service area, and pretty much currently any of the nonprofits that do this work are also doing CIT trainings for police. And so again, there's you even in like trying to develop these alternatives, they're not ideal. And I think one other barrier is um, I know that in healthcare and in social work, there's currently a lot of debate around to what extent should we be involved in carceral systems. Um, and I do see that there is a narrative both in like the nursing, medicine, and in the social work space of, well, we have to have social workers within these systems to have the seat at the table, to bring our perspective. And the thing is, is like any healthcare profession, so you know, social work, mental health counseling, nursing, medicine, all have pretty serious like codes of ethics, um, which really emphasize, and I, I'm going to just refer to the social work one really quickly, that emphasize um, the dignity and worth of every person, the individual right to self-determination. Um, uh, the uh, social work kind of just revise theirs to kind of tighten um, our, our supposed mandate to end racism. And, you, and it's one of those things of what is worth sacrificing in our ethics and values if our ethics and values are supposed to have weight to have the seat at these tables. Um, I think the, the really like, this is my own opinion and people might have others, but really the only way that I can see social workers being in these systems in a way that isn't ethical misconduct is having a clear plan of how am I going to clearly compromise and blow up this, this workplace or system. If you don't have a clear plan of how am I going to compromise this and be a whistleblower and be an agitator and actually inflict some damage, then consider whether you want to get involved in that or not. I'll just say really quickly, because I know we want to jump into the audience um, conversation. No, there is no equitable alternative to the child welfare system as it exists today. Um, the reality for that is because we don't trust black and brown people. We don't trust poor people to raise their children. Um, we want to indoctrinate them with this white dominant class of thinking of how to parent your children. It takes away all of the black culture that we have fought so hard to create. It takes away the, the one thing that poor people can re rely on and have for their own support system, break down their, their, their sense of support. We break down the family unit. We, if it isn't through incarceration, it's through separation. It's through um, orders of protection that prevent people from you know, contacting their children. It's through limiting how often someone can visit their child or talk to their child. You know, People go from seeing their child every day to 32 hours in total in a whole year. Like that's what we're doing, right? So there is nothing to equate to, to make that better. We can't do anything to make that better, right? Um, you know, yes, the little things like, you know, making better motions in court and arguing, and, you know, the least restrictive things. Yeah, we can argue all of that, but quite frankly, that doesn't make it. Will you be happy seeing your kid for a hundred hours a day? Is it gonna, I mean, a hundred hours a year? Does it make a big equitable difference for you to be able to see your child from 30 hours a year to a hundred hours a year when you used to seeing them every single day? No, that is not going to change a damn thing. And so therefore, no, there is no equitable way in which we can address any the alternative as it exists today to the child welfare system, except for us to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, we're a part of this system. We're participating in this system, right? I can't say to my clients, like, I'm not a part of this system. I absolutely am. I absolutely am bargaining with the oppressor, right, for a little bit. <laughs> Please give me a little bit. Please help me make this a little bit better. I am coaching my clients. I, I, sometimes I felt so disgusted when I was coaching my clients into giving up their right to a trial because the state was offering us visitation with their child that was expanded that they probably would never get in another six to eight months, right? Those are the sort of things that we were 
arguing and making exchanges, exchanges about, right? And, and not because I thought they didn't have a good trial, but because I knew that it didn't matter that they had a good trial, right? Like, and sometimes you had to make those decisions. So yeah, we are a part of the system, even when we're advocating on behalf of people in the system and recognizing that we're holding that mirror up. We, we have some of those same biases that we're talking about people have, right? I can't imagine not one of us has sat on this call, haven't been in the store and said, God knows I can't believe they letting that kid behave like that or been somewhere and thought, oh, I can't believe that parent dressed that child like that or X, Y, and Z happened and we made some sort of judgment in the moment, not knowing shit about that parent, not knowing anything about that child, not knowing anything about their circumstances. And that is the sort of judgment times a thousand that takes place in the child welfare system every day. So until we start to hold a mirror up to it and say, we are a part of the problem. And the only way for us to, you know, get rid of this problem is to just literally get rid of the system. We have to work ourselves out of a job, <laughs> right? That is how we get rid of this problem. So that's my very quick answer to no. Well, Emma, do, do I have like, do I have like two seconds to respond? Sure. If you want to go real Sorry. I'll keep it so short. Yeah, I would say the only the only other thing I want people to look out uh, for is um, the lie that the child welfare system is going to be more community oriented, which we're seeing a lot nowadays. Um, they're expanding their initiatives to be community based, community driven, and we see that through the family um, first, like the prevention act, um, where they're trying to make alternatives that are still highly problematic. So I would say, like, when you're thinking about equitable alternatives yourself to not um, buy into the lie that that is going to be a fix and a remedy, like the whole thing needs to go. And what we're seeing is high, uh, millions and billions of dollars being poured into the system for these community alternatives that are still highly problematic and will always be under the current structure of the child welfare system. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. That's a perfect way to end it. All right. Um, Perfect. It looks like somebody already. MJ, would you mind um, asking a question? Sure. Um, I just want to say thank you to to everyone. Joyce is a good friend of mine and my mentor as well, and um, I'm really excited for her to be on this panel. Um, and you all are doing an amazing job. I am a social worker. I work with the Garden at Lightham's office, and I also work with Parents Council, and I teach at the University of Denver Social Workers. What I want to ask you all is what I usually say is that I don't believe that any white person should work with any families of color whatsoever. I don't believe that white America has the moral standards to do what's right by people of color as they have not shown that they can do what's right by people of color. What are your thoughts on that? I always say, and I preface it with, when I'm teaching my white students, unless you are an ally to that group of people, you should not be working with that population. And the only way you are an ally, because I know that's a new buzzword, is if that group of people invited you in, invited you in, and then they said that you're an ally. So it's essentially like if you say, I'm queen of England, you're actually not. You have to be named the queen of England and so forth. So that is where I am because I've been working in this field for almost 12 years now and working with all sides and so forth. But my question is, I know that sounds really harsh, um, and I get a lot of emotional pushback when I say the white people should not touch our families. And, and I mean this with, and I'm Native American as well, Native Americans only with Native Americans, Blacks only with Blacks, Latinos only with Latinos, because I don't know the full capacity of a Latino family, right? I have Latino friends, but that does not mean that I'm basic enough to say, I know everything about Latinos because I know someone that is Latino and so forth. So I just wanted to get your uh, comments, uh, if you have any anything with that with that saying. Can I just add one thing really quickly as it relates to your comment, MJ? I think that's the beautiful. And I think that the only problem that I noticed with that is that skin folk, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And that is a big issue that we see in the child welfare system as it relates to the, the practical standpoint. Um, if you go to the Bronx, New York, most of the child welfare workers are not white women. <laughs> they are black and brown women, right? These are the jobs that are paraded to them. They are good paying jobs, right? They are seen as a, a means to get up out of whatever poverty laden system that they're in. They indo are indoctrinated and internalized the racism of these systems, right? Our clients will talk about the way in which they're dogged out by black and brown women who look just like them. Right, because they are they are thought to be above them, out of their their other. They're, they've created this otherness, right? And then you see that same thing when you get to court. They think, oh, well, the attorney for the state is a black woman. She'll be leaning on me. She'll understand. No, she does not, <laughs> right? You're other to her. You are the, the thing that she has ran away from in life. And then you see the judge and the judge is a black man. And then the judge is even harsher on you. And especially for my clients who were 
um, identifying as LGBTQ, right? And didn't have, and you know, we're not cisgendered female specifically, right? Like, you know, they receive a lot of harshness in the system. So, you know, I think that it would be a, yes, ideologically, that makes a lot of sense, right? And I do agree with that. But I also agree that the second level to that, right? is one having people who understand the culture that they're in and and being named as allies i think is important because there are so many people who are working in the system where if you went to the communities where they work at people in those communities don't see them as allies so i think that's the key part is having them named as allies professor Fowler, would you say that okay so so when we wake up every morning as people of color as non-people of color we hit the subscribe button to whites, we we hit the subscribe button to anti-blackness. Every day we wake up and we have to not be ourselves in order to survive, right? We, we are anti-black in order not to survive. But if you eliminated white people in that aspect of white supremacy, because with white people come the white supremacy, right? Because we're still working mm -hmm. with the structures. Then do you think that there is a chance that we can start healing? Because yes, we as people of color are used as tools against our own community. We know that yeah. with our education, yeah. we're used as a tool against with our skin complexion, we're, we're used as a tool against, but do you, if, if we remove whiteness, right? And I know that's very hard to imagine. None of us can really imagine that because that's, that's never been a thing. But if we remove that, do you think that that is a possibility? Yeah, I do. I think what you're imagining is a free space where black people create. No, so people who are already free thinking black or brown people come into this space and say, we want to create this thing to support us, to champion us, to lift us up. And then we're not going to include the people who are internalized this racism throughout time, right? We're free thinking black people. Yeah, that thing will be beautiful, right? But you know what you need to create that? You need funding and you need resources that are going to be attributed to that. And I guarantee you, when you go into these conversations, and Joyce, you'll back me up. When we go into conversations to talk about, talk to people about funding for things like that, what do they say? Well, is it trauma informed? Right? Do have they got this certification? Have they got this certification that this white supremacist organization is providing them? Right? Like, oh, they don't have these certifications. Is it, it's not evidence based? Thank you. It's not trauma informed. Well, we don't want that not going to fund that we're not going to support that and then the other problem is the people who would support it without that they are they are the other right they're so far removed from the communities that are suffering that they don't even see this as an issue we got to make the harm that is happening to black and brown families in the child welfare system as big of an issue as over policing and mass incarceration is in the united states today it has to become on that level of awareness because i tell you as a person who is now very much entrenched in it there was a time six seven years ago where i thought people who were involved in the child welfare system deserve to be here because they must have done something really bad to their children that was clearly a system that was made to protect people it wasn't until i became entrenched in it that i was like oh no oh no so yes i think what you're imagining is that it, it's that's the goal right that is something that is made for us by us um in which we can truly understand we can bring in our own allies and we are sort of relying on ourselves as a system of support as opposed to some government entity. Yes, I do. I think that can happen. I think that could happen. And I think that should happen. I don't know if we can get there tomorrow as long as they continue to use their straining system to keep us from getting the credentials we need to be there in a holistic um, way that makes sense where we're not being harmful under the guise of trying to help. But with that being said, for me, I'm very uncomfortable personally receiving quite a few different services from white people because you can't break me and then try to fix me. They want to celebrate reunification day after they rip the family apart. So we get to tear you apart, break you down, traumatize you, you know, visits as Fallon was talking about. There is over 8,000 days in a year. And on average, parents whose kids stay in foster care for the entire year, just as a starting point, are only entitled to 104 of those hours, which if you break that down is only four days out of the year. And I can assure you that they don't see children at each and every scheduled visit. So what are we actually doing? And how can you, the same person who put this in place, now have this awakening and want to be a do-gooder and suddenly you want to operate on me and fix me i'll pass and what i find is i do have 
white people who are my allies. And I will say they're my allies, but the white people who I will call my allies didn't start as my allies. They began wanting to be my allies, but they didn't become my allies until they understood they have to stand behind me. This is my life. This is my experience. This is my community. You don't get to lead me in my experiences and tell me what's best for me. And it's the same thing. You want to be my ally until you start feeling she has a lot of nerve as a black girl. She has a lot of audacity. I have the same thing you have. It's just that you have not acknowledged it for generations and you have not recognized it, but change is coming. All right, thank you. And we have um, another question that was posed in the chat previously um, by Eleanor, I believe. Um, Eleanor, would you like to ask that out loud or would you like me to ask it? No, I hope she wants us to ask it, Emma. Okay, awesome. So should abuse and neglect court cases be open or closed to the public? Open. Open. So I answered that in the um in the chat as well, but yes, I, I have practiced in two jurisdictions where one was open and one was closed. Um, in the closed jurisdiction, I won't name them out loud because this is recorded, but in the closed jurisdiction, um, you know, oftentimes you would see attorneys, and you see this in the open too, but you no, know, I mean, they would literally down talk their clients in court. You would see them talking to judges and opposing counsel in an unfavorable way about their client. Um, you know, if parents were waiting outside, these are court cases, um, courtrooms where the court doors would be locked once the case is called, right? And so parents, oftentimes I, I saw a termination proceeding where a parent was literally waiting outside while the proceeding was happening in court. And then at the end of the proceeding, the judge said to counsel, um, do you want to go talk to your client and give them their warning about a uh, appeal as opposed to saying, oh crap, we, you know, let's bring this in and let's have this hearing. And that's exactly what happened, right? Um, and so I think that when the proceeding is closed, that clients get worse outcomes than when the proceeding is open and people are able to come in and hold some level of accountability to um, not only the judge, but to people who are um, the, the social workers, right? Um, people can, you know, family members, people can come in and contradict what they're saying, right? Um, and the people who are advocating on behalf of children, people can come in and advocate. In closed courtrooms, oftentimes children aren't even allowed in the courtroom. Um, and so the other thing I would add is that oftentimes in closed courtrooms, um, you have jurisdictions where the proceeding is recorded. So there's no transcript of what's happening there. Um, and that is a complete disservice to families, um, not only in the, within the proceeding itself, but down the line, there is no record of what the judge or what the family or what the parent is bringing up um, in these cases. And so I think the losing track of that record is a disservice to families. We actually have a follow-up question to this. So in an open court, how is the child's privacy maintained or even the parent's privacy? Or is that a non-issue? And thank you, Kim, for posing this question. No, my hand's going up so fast on that. Because here's yeah. something I've been complaining about for months now, and no one seems to care. In New York City, we have ACS, the Administration for Children's Services. Their state oversight agency is OCFS, Office of Family and Child Services. They are selling children on their website every day. What is the difference between selling a child on the save block and selling a child digitally online? They literally have little black children on their website, selling them like puppies in a pound. This child likes her favorite color is um, she prefers playing with older kids, maybe a little rough with smaller children, um, what needs a family that sets tight boundaries, all of this stuff. And some of the children even have tags on their little bodies that say on hold. There is nothing more disturbing and disgusting than that. So don't tell me that we need to protect their privacy when a parent's trying to bring transparency to keep their kid home. But then all of a sudden children don't need any privacy. We can put them in the front window of OCFS with all of the viewers that they have on that website and sell the children to the highest bidder. They even have a place where you can put in the child you want. You can choose the age. Do you want an eight-year-old to 12-year-old, a two-year-old to six-year-old? Do you want a male, a female? Um, do you want them to be tall or short? Are you freaking kidding me? Am I ordering lunch here? Mm -hmm. So there's no privacy for children in that setting. Oh, someone just put the link in the um, chat box. Thank you, Angela Burton, for dropping that in the chat. 
The link is there for you to see the children on display on the OCFS website. But this is not just happening in New York. It's happening across the 50 states. And what we need is transparency in family court. Because if there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to hide. If a parent did something wrong, then let's deal with it. Yeah, I would just add, sorry, I just want to add really quickly, Joyce, and the, uh, to just add into that, the only other thing about the transparency piece is it's a line of thinking we're protecting somehow privacy that goes into the same line of thinking that says children shouldn't testify in court, right? We shouldn't hear from children in court. You, you know how many times, I, I mean, that is a big thing in Virginia. Oh, why are you asking that child to come to court and testify? Because that child made statements, allegedly. <laughs> like, you know, they allegedly said this. We don't know. We weren't there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right it's that sign, same line of thinking that's like let's protect children that is not protecting children it's not protecting families and what it's really saying is we should rely on the system and what the system is perpetuating that's the truth as opposed mm -hmm. to seeking it in court and let me tell you the system is also so bold that i had a parent that i was working with here in new york and i brought a city council member to the um, court hearing as they were trying to terminate the mom's rights. And they intimidated that city council member so bad, he came back one time with me. And after that, he was like, he can't go back. They was making him put himself on record. They was just doing the most. And then they accused him, they sent him a letter saying that he was trying to sway the outcome of the case with his presence. So he stopped coming, but I went back better because after that I had two state senators attend every court hearing with me for that same client. And guess what? They was just as off the hook with the senators being there because it's like, yeah, you can try to change some legislation, but in here we're the boss and we're gonna do what we wanna do. They did not respect them. The community needs to see, the community needs to know. Everyone on every level needs to understand what's happening in family court and everyone needs to say change is needed. And with yeah. that, we're gonna be in the same place. Yeah, I, w I just wanna say that like, it's really, really important for us as social workers to see what happens in court because I have been, before I was in social work, I was um, just in court all the time. And like the power that social workers have in court over children's lives is really ridiculous. They could say something and not know anything about the current situation in terms of what's happening at school, what's happening um, in other systems. Cause I, I worked with an, on a lot of cases where children were also in uh, the criminal justice system, they were on probation. And so you had caseworkers or social workers um, in DCFS who are representing children and completely lying on the stand. And of course the judge is gonna, um, is gonna take the word of the caseworker social worker over the child or over the parent and so it's so important for us as social workers to understand the power that we have and and uh for people to see how that power is used in the courts against the children and families it's really absolutely heartbreaking to watch and it's infuriating and i think that we often try to distance ourselves from that and it's absolutely continuing to happen and we try to point our fingers to the judge and to you know um police or a different just different entities and never point the finger at ourselves and i think it's very very important because in my cases the most people i had issues with were the um the people the case workers or social workers who were over uh, the cases so just to add that in all right, thank you everyone. We have about three minutes if we can get this really quick. And then the last five minutes, we're gonna just kind of wrap up. But this question is from Samira. It relates to what you touched upon, Victoria. So it is, what should we do as mandated reporters when our employers and licensing bodies demand that we make reports that we know are harmful, thinking about the here and now as we work towards abolition? And we just gotta be like kind of mindful of the time because I know we have two folks on Eastern time. So wanna wrap up. Yeah, um, like I said, when I was collaborating, um, this was something that got brought up a whole lot. And essentially the things that were recommended were things that other social workers across the country were doing is just trying to minimize the harm as much as possible. Um, so can you in, can you involve can you can you involve the family with the call? Can you make the call? Can you make the call with them so they hear what you're saying? Um, can you um, can you uh, request that the operator repeat back everything that you are saying to ensure that there is an accurate record? And sometimes operators can be really callous or they really wanna rush this through and you are able, take that time. Um, always try to consider connecting to other resources because sometimes in cases, um, what the investigator is saying is telling a parent that their adolescent child needs to not sleep overnight in the home during the investigation. And then, you know, you have to be able to advocate, okay, so if you're going to demand this, 
what's the safe alternative housing? Are, are you going to support and, and, and work with that? Um, there really are not, and I know that Joyce will go on about this, there really are not Miranda rights for parents in this system. So you have to really be open about that. Um, there aren't, you know, there aren't, aren't those, you know, rights to remain silent. Anything you say or don't say will be frequently used against you. Um, and then also that piece of um, whenever possible, try to, try to, you know, do take a risk and blow the whistle or really try to bring some of these harmful issues to light because I think that frequently with social work, there's so much thriving on silence. And part of that is because our, some, there are sections of our, so, of our social work code of ethic that kind of create the blue wall of silence where we can't disparage our colleagues um, if it's quote unwarranted, um, where there's a lot of times there's, you know, you can get the accusation that you're operating outside of your scope of practice, but really like we have to start taking some risks and really pour more sunlight and more open critiques and really start to rip this open because it's, you know, the system really thrives on our silence and, and thrives on our complicity. And we, this, we need a moment, we need more like daily moments of mass non-compliance, if that makes sense. Um, I'll Mark, say if you wanna, oh, sorry. I was just gonna ask if you wanted to um, end with the final comment, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll say really quickly, um, I think it takes, takes risk on our parts as social workers and practitioners and really thinking about you know where the root of your report is coming from i think this is important thinking about you know being rooted in community what are the resources that exist in that place that can help um and where can you find them i think it's so much cookie cookie culture um cookie cutter culture where we're just doing what we're being told but it's like take a moment and think creatively how can you mitigate the risk what can you do in your power to help a family because what you're going to subject them to immediately when you make the call is a world full of harm and we've already discussed all the different systems that they're going to be intertwined with so what what are you willing to risk and it, are you is your status or your license more important than the communities and families that we serve and that's the whole root of being a mandated supporter i mean just think about there's no you know there's a, a litany of consequences that you know social workers can receive for not reporting but none for not supporting families and I, that's the problem where's the accountability for our lack of support for families that's the issue so yeah i, th I think we have to look in ourselves i have to look at one another and be willing to take that risk um, for the greater good of who we are claiming to serve and um, as has already been mentioned, the ethics that we claim to uphold as social workers. That was a perfect end note. Thank you all again. This has been an immensely powerful conversation and I know that all the attendees like really appreciate you. Sorry, I don't wanna put words in people's mouths. Um, I am gonna share my screen real quick with some closing comments. So hopefully you can see that, but this just contains um, some information about a feedback survey for folks who attended and panelists feel free to also fill that out. Um, so the recording and transcript will be shared for those who registered. Um, you can expect an email as well as this will be posted to RPH also has a YouTube page. Um, so it will be posted to there. Feel free to share out. Um, like I said, this has been an incredibly powerful conversation. Also, if you would like to connect with radical public health in the future, here are some of our um, social media contact information. But we will post the feedback survey in the chat. And then I'm going to stop sharing so we can all wave and thank our panelists before we log off. <laughs> if I stop sharing. There we go. Thank you guys very much. This has been great. Thank you, Elena, Victoria, Mark, Kamaria, mm -hmm. all you guys, Fallon, definitely. I love working with you guys. I've worked with each of you and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Yes. MJ, shout out. Angela Burton, shout out. I hope you guys get that thing out the chat right there where you can see the little black kids being sold and having on hold on their chest. Did, did we click on that link, y'all? Get it out that chat before we shut down here. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Breaks my heart. They're not selling us on the slave block no more. All you need is internet service and they're for sale. They're being weak. Thank you. 
everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.